Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Let's just wait a second or two. Does anybody know if uh, Pern is coming today? She's on vacation. Okay, then I guess we can proceed. Okay. All righty. Uh, Teenage girl walks into your office. She's an excellent athlete. And uh, this is the resting ECG. And I was called by a cardiologist to take a look at this tracing. So I'm going to ask Dr. Obiaka what she thinks about this tracing. Good morning, Dr. Paz. Uh, so looking at the uh, tracing. So an upright in uh, upright P wave in one and EVF. We're looking at the long strip below. Um, we have a variable hatch rate. If you see a P in front of every QRS uh, with a steady PR interval, um, it just looks. Um, there's some irregularity, like I said, in the heart rate. So I'm just trying to figure out if this is a sinus arrhythmia, if there are some PACs that I'm missing. Just a minute. Mm -hmm. The P's seem to come on time. Mm -hmm. So I would call the sinus arrhythmia. Okay, I agree with that statement. But uh, so your... Uh out in Alabama, and uh, this is the tracing. Do you, anything else of any kind? Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm looking to see if there's anything else that I'm concerned about. So. My T waves are flattish in V1. I'm just trying to figure out where it are they are in my other waves, in my other leaks. Um, so this is a teenage girl. My QT actually looks a little bit long. Well, well let me it see. actually comes out. So, yeah. Yeah, so you know, generally arm. speaking, when you want as a rule of thumb with QT, well, one thing you know is that uh, if the T wave ends before halfway of the R to R interval, generally the QTC is less than 460. That's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb. Also, when the heart rate is 60, the QT measured equals the QTC. Okay. So if the heart rate is 69, the QTC is gonna be roughly equal to the QT interval in this particular case. And the QT interval is not much above 400. So I don't think the QT, interval is long in this particular case. So it's always, you're right to always assess that and be careful, make sure you're not missing a uh, abnormal QT interval. But in this particular case, I think it is normal. Any other concerns possibly? Uh, my T waves in my lateral leads, they're all inverted. Yes. So in, uh, yeah, so in V4, V5, V6, I have all inverted T's. Um, so is that so a I'm normal concerned. find? No, I'm no, I am concerned about those T waves. Mm -hmm. what, what is your concern? Um, you are so, correct to be concerned. Yeah, I, yeah. So with the T wave abnormality, I'm just wondering if there's any um, ventricular issues, um, conduction problems. Well, I mean, your QRS is narrow and your PR interval is normal. So there doesn't appear to be any conduction abnormalities, but uh, what could the T wave inversion be associated with? 
ventricular um, enlargements. Okay. Is there a particular disorder you would be most concerned about? Um, so my T, my V1, V2 are fine. So I'm not thinking, you know, like a Brugada kind of issue. That's not really that's, a, uh, that's important. That's an important. Now, I agree so. with that. I agree with that. So what I'm trying to get at is uh, T wave inversions, particularly in the lateral precordial leads in a teenager, are always abnormal. And uh, the thing you should think about when you see an ECG like this is whether or not a patient might have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, uh, or any kind of cardiomyopathy, but particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And oftentimes the ECG can be more sensitive for this diagnosis than even an echocardiogram. Um, and sometimes what will happen is the ECG will be abnormal and then a year or two or three later, the echo will start to be abnormal. In this particular patient, um, I was told that the echocardiogram showed a thick left ventricle with normal uh, function. So this is uh, a distinctly abnormal ECG. And I believe that with these types of inversions, the chances of it being a cardiomyopathy are in the range of 20 or 30%, something like that. So um, if you saw this tracing, let's say this was just obtained for some other reason, and chances are in your new position, you will at some time be given a stack of electrocardiograms to read. Um, what are you going to ask of, what are you going to do when you see a tracing like this? So I'm going to um, ask about the history of symptoms. Um, so okay. history Let's of- say, uh, what, what symptoms are you concerned about? Um, this now chest pain on, uh, with activity, um, any history of syncope or near syncope, any family history. Okay, um, so family one. history would be the most important. What are you, what yeah. family history of what though? So family history of uh, sudden cardiac death or near um, cardiac death or any um, arrhythmias mm -hmm. um, and or any deaths with activity. Um, those are the, the things right. that we or have. cardiomyopathies of any sort. Yeah. I can give you an example. I had a patient once with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Both parents were asymptomatic, but when you took a careful history, Turns out the grandfather of the patient died waiting for a heart transplant from cardiomyopathy 30 years earlier. So sometimes that can be the type of history that people just blow off because sometimes 30 or 40 years ago, people may not have even known what it is that the patient, you know, the index case had. Um, okay, so you see this ECG and um, what kind of testing do you want to do? So like you already said, the first thing I would do after getting the history is to do an echocardiogram. Uh, right. I've been looking at the um, so LV thickness, echo. the septal thickness. Uh, Let's say that the uh, echo is uh, it's not very abnormal. What would you then do or would you do anything else? Um, so there are a couple of things I can do if the echo is not very abnormal and if I'm still concerned, if I still have a you know high index of suspicion, I could do, um, I could stress uh, the patients uh, to see if they have any symptoms. And I could also do some genetic testing as well right, um, so to see if I can identify any genetic mutations. So you definitely, it's actually now formally recommended that genetic testing be done in anybody who is believed to have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So yes, that I agree with. Stress test, I think, um, wh why are you doing a stress I know, test? So that, that is, so that is controversial. I know I've, you know, some people, I think some people think it's not necessary to stress somebody who you're concerned might actually be symptomatic. I would just said it based on, you know, if you have a patient who doesn't really exercise or you're not sure of the exercise you're looking for, um, you know, some ST segment changes or worsen um, um, ST segment T wave abnormalities just to see. And just even abnormal blood pressure response um, from the stress testing can also- um, It's really that last point, which is one of the risk factors for sudden cardiac death and hypertrophs is an inappropriate response of blood pressure to exercise. Uh, 
as you know, when people exercise, their blood pressure rises, but people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy often will have an inadequate rise. So they'll have a rise in their blood pressure, but it will not be as high as would be expected. And that is, is a soft but real uh, association with sudden cardiac death. Some people would say that if you have uh, these types of T waves and with exercise, they flip upward to normal position so that the T waves look normal, but that would be a more benign finding than somebody who had um, inversions all the time. So I don't know if that's true, but there are, there are those who believe that. In fact, somebody told me recently, a former fellow, that I told them that that was what you should always do. I, I know that can't be true because I didn't know it myself, but um, that's possible. Um, another thing that you probably would do if the echo was normal is you would probably do an MRI, right? Uh, what would an MRI be able to tell you? So in a patient who had a, a technically dissolved echo MRI, an MRI can tell you more about the uh, septal thickness. Let's say and, that the yeah. patient had a technically beautiful echo because you performed it and we know you are excellent at that. So, and so you the see, MRI... a little bit of, see a little bit of LVH, but you're not really sure, is this an athlete's heart or is mm -hmm. this um, a hypertrophic yeah. cardiomyopathy? Because this is an excellent athlete. She's uh, apparently gonna go to a very prominent college because of her athletic skills. Um, how so would you the, the MRI could also show us if there's like ischemic changes um, or thinning of falls. Well, it's um, not so much ischemic changes, but you're looking for delayed enhancement. Delayed enhancement, yeah. Right. And the other thing that's interesting, and this came out in a paper um, from England not long ago, which I reviewed on my podcast about a year ago, is that a small percentage, but not tiny, uh, have apical hypertrophy that cannot be seen on echo. So you can do of hypertrophs. So you can do a, uh, a, a regular transthoracic echo, have maybe only mildly thickened heart that could be consistent with an athlete's heart and not see apical hypertrophy. So uh, an MRI is useful at ruling that out. But I think the point I'm trying to make with this ECG is when you see an ECG like this with these types of very unusual T waves, particularly in the left lateral precordial leads in anybody beyond the newborn or first couple of months of life, this is a very, very abnormal appearing ECG. This was uh, not long ago, one of our referring cardiologists saw this. And so this should prick up your ears. This is why it's useful to just read lots and lots of EKGs because this is very abnormal in appearance, and uh, this should make you wonder if there's something wrong. Also, these T waves in lead two, very and in one, very, very abnormal. So um, always should think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy when you see that. Okay. This is a tracing of uh, somebody who received a 20 joule shock here. And uh, should this have been cardioverted with sync off? Why or why not? Um, I will ask your colleague, Dr. Neha Alwalia, what she thinks about this. Morning, Dr. Bass. Hello, Neha. Uh, um, so in the beginning, we see a rapid heart rate. Um, it's not quite clear what the QRS is, if it's um, wide or narrow. I mean, mm -hmm. it looks wide, but um, you know, sometimes you can have those T, like the T waves, which seem um, wider, but you can get confused. But um, I would say this is a wide complex um, tachycardia. Um, and the heart rate is um, around 300, a little less than 300. Mm -hmm. um, and then do we know if the patient was uh, okay with during this or no? I think this actually comes from a neonatal ICU. And uh, oh. 
patient uh, wasn't complaining, but uh, uh -huh. rarely do at that age. <laughs> right. Um, and then... I guess okay. I should have asked, do you have any criticism of, of this tracing? Um, do you feel that the people responsible for this tracing which by the way, does not come from our institution. Uh, not that it matters, but uh, do you feel that this is done properly, improperly? Uh, what do you, what's your thoughts? So I'm guessing we are discussing about this. It's not done properly. Uh, uh, sometimes I'll show you normal traits <laughs> and try to fool you. I will do that on occasion. Um, Being a somewhat devious person, though not very. Oh. Um, so what are these little uh, arrows? So it's try, this is, I think, the machine that's trying to sync with the um, T QRSs, but it's not syncing appropriately. Um, the if yeah, so the arrows are sort of lagging uh, behind, or you can say in front, whatever. But they're not on time with the QRSs. Oh. Um, so it seems to be not syncing. Um, not sensing properly, right? Not sensing, yeah. Right. So that's the, I think that's the main teaching point that I'd like to make mm -hmm. this tracing is that if you look at this tracing, it appears like you could make an argument that maybe it does seem to be sensing on a similar portion of the QRS here, but then you start getting these, this one here, with this one, these two don't seem to be. And really, if you look closely, the relationship of the sensing arrow and the morphology of the QRS is, the relationship is changing. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that it is not sensing properly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is, uh, should it have been cardiovascular with sync off? The answer is no, it should have no. been synced. But right. the problem here is that the patient wasn't, it wasn't properly synced. So you hook it up. So it's always important when you're going to cardiovert somebody and you're using synchronization, which is what you should do for any reentrant type of arrhythmia um, to make sure that it's syncing properly. And the way that you tell is by looking at the arrows that the almost all defibrillators have some, some equivalent of an arrow that will point at each QRS and mm -hmm. it's a good way to know if the system can tell what's going on. Now, normally, where do we do our sensing from? When we're using pads, how do we normally sense um, the QRS for synchronization during a cardioversion? How do we sense as in- Like we where are we sensing from? What, QRS. What's tech, okay, that's true. But what are we technically, how do we technically get a QRS to sense from? Like what, like what the are RV. we using? But what um, lead are we using? Like, are we, how do we get, so you put your pads on the patient, you turn on sync. How does the system even see the QRS at all? I don't understand. I mean, we don't have an EKG hooked up to the patient. So uh, how do we see the QRS? Uh, let me see. No, I mean, on the machine, we see the, QRS. So, but where's uh, it getting from, that QRS from? Is it some magical process that when you turn it on, it looks for the part rate in the room that's the fastest and somehow <laughs> it's recorded? I mean, from the two pads that we put from in, you would. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. The pads are used, are actually being used as ECG leads as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that for most defibrillators, the uh, filtering is very good on those and you usually get a very good clear QRS, oftentimes better than an ECG um, that the system uses and is you know, it's de designed to properly sense through those pads. But sometimes uh, you get something like this. Now in this case, they're using paddles. Now when you use paddles that you're holding with your hands, which by the way is perfectly reasonable, Although I'm guessing, I'm getting, I'm betting that almost no one has ever seen those used um, because we almost always use pads. And the reason we, why do we use pads over paddles? I'm 
just good contact and stable position. Well, but you can uh, put the paddles on and hold really tight. On TV, in emergency rooms, they always show like you. Like burns from the paddles? No, same, 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 same. risk for burns. Um, Right, like in, when you're watching like uh, TV programs and dramas, they always use the yeah. paddles, right? Stand it's just back. more dramatic. <laughs> very dramatic. Why do we not do that in real life very often? We can, right? The paddles are there, but you, you almost never see someone just grab the paddles and say, let me defibrillate this patient. Right? We always very boringly open up this package of, pa of <laughs> ads. Why do we do that and not do what they do on TV, which seems so much- I don't know. We don't like drama. And we it's... don't like drama. <laughs> drama. We're in a drama-free zone here. No, it's because um, it's more dangerous. Because dangerous. if you're holding the paddles, you could accidentally- Shock yourself. And shock yeah. yourself. So mm -hmm. in general, we would rather use the pads. The other advantage is that with the pads, the sensing is better. So you can actually sense through paddles, but because you're physically holding the paddles with your hands, your hands are shaking a little bit. And so, and they may not be exactly in the stable position on the patient. So if you're sensing through the paddles, the QRS may not be as clear. Mm -hmm. And so the system will not sense it as well. So when you're mm -hmm. using paddles, Generally speaking, it's better to have an EKG on. And I don't know if you're aware, but on all defibrillators, there's usually a cable with EKG stickers that you can attach to the patient. And then you can choose which lead you want to use to sense. So let's say instead of being paddles, so, so paddles, you're getting this terrible, uh, very bad sensing. So... Um, what would your next move be, uh, Neha? You saying you're there at the bedside, you're like, uh, Dr. Pass told me I shouldn't really use paddles and the sensing seems seems um, you know, unstable here. So I'm going to change to this approach to cardiovert. What would be your next uh, thing you could try? As you were saying, we can hook up the EKG and connect it. Right, you if could hook up the EKG, right. So you could use the EKG uh, leads that come with the device is usually a cable mm -hmm. and usually sitting wrapped up where it has never been opened before, but it is there. Mm -hmm. So you can use the EKG or you could just put pads on. Yeah. Right. So um, <clears throat> like in the cath lab, when we're doing an EP study, we usually do not put separate EKG leads for the defibrillator. We usually sense through the pads. Uh, in my old lab at Montefiore, I actually pr I actually had them design it so that the ECG that was going to the anesthesiologist's cart was wide into the defibrillator through the hard wiring of the room so that the defibrillator, yes. even if it wasn't attached to the patient, always had the ECG on it, separate from the pads. So, And the default on the device was to use that ECG. But the pads worked very well as well. So... Mm -hmm just some uh, practical pointers about cardioversions. And if this was a neonate, that seems to be a lot of energy also, like 20, right? Like uh, yes, were... it does. That's a big <laughs> um, good point. That would probably be in the range of five per kilo or something. So what would your dose be for this arrhythmia that you're seeing on the left side, which looks like possibly VT? Uh, one per kilo and then can increase to two. So uh, you're saying that if you had a patient with a VT, I just wanna make sure I understand because the sound is poor here, that uh, you would give one per kilo for VT and if it failed, you would go to two. Is that what you just said? Just wanna make sure. Yeah, yes. And that is erroneous. Uh, VT, we give two joules per kilo. Two. Mm. Okay, remember that, that's very important. And that is an error I have seen done before uh, when patients, you know, when we're doing the debriefing after a, a bad event, I've seen this on more than one occasion where people gave one joule per kilo for a ventricular arrhythmia. The dose for ventricular arrhythmias is two per kilo. And if that fails, you go to four per kilo. That is a very, very important point. And if I could make one sort of overall uh, observation, I would say, when in doubt, give two joules per kilo. No one will almost ever complain to you if you give a little too much but you will certainly hear complaints if you give too little, okay? And in fact, uh, there's 
in the adult literature, I think I've spoken with a couple of you guys about this, uh, for atrial fibrillation, there's a large literature showing that if you give the maximum amount on the defibrillator, which in a biphasic device, I think is 150 joules, that that actually on average works better than doing one joule per kilo, which is of course the more common or the more traditional amount that you're supposed to give for any SVT or primary atrial arrhythmia. So uh, always remember for VT two joules per kilo, nobody will ever, will ever um, complain that you gave too much. Even if you were wrong and it was SVT, there's usually no harm, okay? What is the only harm of giving too much energy now? So, so you, you appropriately identify whether this is VT or SVT, if this is a baby, 20 joules seems a bit excessive. Um, what is the downside of giving this much energy? Uh, can you cause like brief long pause after that? Well, you, you can have a long pause after any cardioversion. Uh, sometimes. Right. No, I mean, like with higher energies. If that I don't believe that that causes any more of a pause. I'm not aware of uh -huh. it being a concern. Uh -huh. um, not sure. What does uh, cardioversion energy do to the function of the heart? Decreases, like it, it causes, yeah, it causes a it, transient function. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's certainly a negative inotrope of sorts, if you want to think of it that mm -hmm. way. So when you cardiovert somebody with a lot of energy, you do reduce function at least temporarily. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be one potential negative of giving too much. But generally speaking, there aren't a whole lot of bad negatives to giving too much. And that's part of the reason why AEDs work. Right? How does an AED know that the patient, right? You have these AEDs that are all over schools and uh, public places, thankfully. And uh, sometimes 98 pound grandmothers die at arrest and sometimes 250 pound men arrest. How does the AED know how much energy to deliver? Yeah, I guess it's just a standard energy, like high. Right, energy. it's always given the maximal amount. Yeah. And uh, it's so uh, the point is too much is almost never a problem. Too little, though, can be. Okay. A quick question. Um, okay. So, my question is um, for pulseless VTAC, um, is there utility to sync? Um, and if yes, why does PAL say just defibrillate? Um, I don't know why it says to just defibrillate. If you're really sure it's, it's VT, then you should sink, I would say. I can't really think of a great reason not to. I will say there's one concern I have with sinking in any patient, and I've talked about this before, and it's very important. In the present era, we use pads virtually 100% of the time, unless somebody is arresting. You know, we already talked about why we don't use paddles too much, but there's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with using paddles, just FYI, but so you're using pads. And uh, one of the downsides of using sync is if it's having trouble synchronizing, you know, once you hit the button to defibrillate, so you charge the device and then you say, clear the bed and you press the defibrillation button or the cardioversion button. Sometimes it does not deliver because it will not deliver unless it can sense a prior beat uh, because it's programmed to try and not put the shock on a T wave. But sometimes if the sensing is bad, if the synchronization is poor, it will wait. And <clears throat> if you're standing at the bed space, you press the button and nothing happens for five, 10, 15 seconds, it is natural to say, hmm, I wonder why this isn't working. And then you go to the patient and you maybe check the pads or you push on the pads because you think maybe there's bad contact and then whammo, the device defibrillates, not only the patient, but you. So always remember that when you're, car when you're synchronizing that uh, if it does not deliver a shock and you do not understand why it is not delivering a shock, you should um, turn the device off or at least turn it off from the shocking, just put it in the you know, ECG mode, then figure out why it isn't delivering. I I'm guessing, David, that the reason that they probably say not to use sync 
is because sometimes the device will have trouble synchronizing and it may delay delivery of a shock. That's probably the reason, I'm guessing. So Dr. Pass, in a case like this, say, you know, if Ne has done all the maneuvers, she can, and we're still not able to get the pads to sense. Mm -hmm. Is there any, and the patient, say the patient is unstable, um, and we so know then, that if we, so then can we just defibrillate? What's no, the harm no, in no. going ahead? No, then what you should do is use the ECG cable that comes with the device and put that on. And once the ECG cable is attached in all defibrillators, there's an option to choose which lead you want to use. You'll actually, one of them will be, one lead will be pads. It'll say pads. Other leads will be, you know, one, two, and three, or whatever the leads are that the device gives you. Usually they give you at least a six lead ECG choice. <laughs> so you should be able to use one, two, three, AVL, AVR, or AVF. Okay, and sorry, I have one more question. When we say, so usually we, we talk about the pause that, ha that can happen when we um, give a shock. Mm -hmm. um, so say you're in a situation where you give a shock and you have like a long pause and you have to pace. Like, yeah. have you, like, I just, you know, I know we can pace with the pads, but I've never, you know, seen it done. I've never been mm -hmm. in that position. Okay. So can you just explain? Yes, so uh, I wish I had a picture of the, the device in front of me, uh, but basically there is a pacing modality uh, and you just sort of turn it on. And this is the most important feature about pacing through pads. That's very important. Um, when you start pacing through pads, it's sending a very large amount of energy that stimulates, that is intended to stimulate the heart. But there's a lot of skeletal muscle between the pads and the heart. And so when you start pacing, and it's usually just one of the settings on the same knob as defibrillating, um, it's always a good idea to start at a very high output. And what's gonna happen is, is that you're going to see that the entire body of the patient is gonna shake with the rate of the pacing. And that's because the device is capturing the skeletal muscle uh, of the chest. And so the chest is sort of jumping with every paced beat because you're stimulating uh, so aggressively. But this is a very important point. The fact that you're seeing stimulation of the skeletal muscle does not necessarily mean that you're capturing the heart. You naturally would assume you are, but you may not be. And so you need to look at the EKG. Now the artifact from pacing externally is very large, but you can see a QRS after it if you are capturing. So you must run an EKG of some sort while you're pacing in order to see if you're capturing the QRS because you will be fooled into thinking you are by stimulating the chest muscle. Um, but you may not be capturing the heart as well. When you're capturing the heart, both the chest will be moving, but also the uh, ECG should show a QRS after each pace beat. So typically what we do is you turn it up to a very high output and then you slowly decrease the output until you do not see capture. And then you increase it a little above that so that you have capture so that you're not giving the maximal amount of energy. So uh, Uzo, since you brought this question up and we're talking about a four kilo infant in the NICU, uh, let's say as you described that you give the shock and then there's this very uncomfortable pause. Would you use the pads to deliver pacing? Um, is there any concerns you might have in pacing somebody transcutaneously who is so would, four kilos? Burns, I would be worried about the injury. Right, uh, so, so injury. in anybody who's basically below a year of age, I would not recommend using pads for pacing. You should do CPR. If you're that concerned that the patient's pause is too long, you should start doing CPR. It is safer than using pacing through pads, okay? Um, in small infants, because uh, Dr. Walsh in Boston used to say that, you know, I think he used to say 30 seconds of pacing transcutaneously will cause second or third degree burns in an infant. So okay. you really ought not to use those. If you're worried about a pause, do CPR, compress the chest, do not pace externally. Um, I will tell you that I have seen 
a patient a couple of years, many years ago, I got called about a hypoplast that was arresting and uh, I was home. And so I rushed into the hospital and I come into the uh, room where the patient, obviously there's this big mess everywhere because they've been doing a CPR. And I see that the patient is being paced externally and the chest is jumping and there is no capture of the QRS. And this has been going on for an indeterminate period of time because it took me 17 minutes to get into the hospital that one time. And <clears throat> I remember being very, very upset because even an attending intensivist did not realize that the presence of skeletal stimulation from, from transcutaneous pacing does not necessarily equal capture of the heart. So you must check on the ECG that there is a QRS following each of these large pacing spikes from external pacing if you have a larger, older patient. Okay, it's a very, very important point. So the, key, the best way to do this again is to turn it to the largest or highest output possible and then confirm that you're getting capture of the QRS and then slowly walk down the output until you lose capture and then go a little bit above it. Okay, that's an important point. So thank you for asking. Okay, so this is a strange tracing, but this uh, triangular thing in the middle was a big shadow. This is a very big thing I notice as people take pictures of EKG and I get a, a little shadow of their hands in the middle. So I lightened it so that you could see the tracing a little better. This is a V2 is an AWAR tracing in this uh, post-operative patient. And I'm going to go to uh, Dr. David Barris to ask him what he thinks is going on here. Okay, so I'm looking at um, the rate first. Um, and I'm looking like I see uh, about one and a half uh, boxes between, um, between each beat. So that'll give me a rate of about 200 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. um, now kind of, I'm looking at, um, looking at my, uh, my leads here. Is V2 an atrial electrogram? Yes, it is. In fact, that's what it says right here at the top, a wire tracing V2. Oh, oh look at that. Um, so looking at that, I feel like I see um, possibly two um, atrial spikes. One comes after the QRS and one comes um, precedes um, the QRS complex. Um, so we could be dealing with a t an atrial flutter or two to one. That's very good, David. That's exactly right. That's an example of two to one flutter, or at least the uh, atrial flutter. What's the atrial flutter rate? So the flutter rate, let's see here. So it will be about 400 if it's if we're two to one. Okay, yep, that's correct. So uh, patient is stable for now. Um, how would you manage this? So we can, um, so we, if the patient was able to be sedated in ICU, we could do a synchronized cardioversion um, is an option. Yes, um, true. How much would you give? How much energy? So we can do um, one joule per kilo synchronized. Okay. That's, that's certainly very reasonable. Any other options? We can use, um, yeah, we can use medication as well. Um, we could use propanolol, um, I think sodalol. Um, we can try to um, pace out of it if we have our atrial wires in post-op. Right. So if you were going to atrial pace out, how would you do that? So we'd want a rapid atrial pace um, at a rate um, that, I mean, at a, at a, I guess I'm trying to think because if the, if the flutter rate's 400, I think we would have to pace at a higher rate than that. Mm -hmm. So we would want to turn uh, turn slightly above that and do it for maybe five or so seconds to see if we if we are able to get to back to sinus rhythm. That's right. That's right. So you can try to try to get get the tech, try to block one of the limbs of the flutter rate of the flutter by doing that. And that's actually what what was done in this patient was uh, rapid atrial pacing. Sometimes you have to do it a number of times until you. You capture the atrium. One of the problems with pacing that fast is 
sometimes the atrium won't capture that that fast of a rate. Um, so sometimes you want to be pretty close to the tachycardia rate because if you go a lot faster, you may not capture. In this particular case, we were able to capture. We actually uh, were able to terminate the atrial flutter and put the patient into orthodromic reentry and tachycardia, which they also had, and then we were able to pace terminate that. So, um, but yes, synchronized cardioversion would never be the wrong choice. Very reasonable in a uh, post-op patient. Okay, and this is the uh, last uh, tracing of the day. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, rapid atrial pacing. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Grace Kong uh, of Texas uh, what she thinks is going on in this. Uh, so I'll just, so I can, just for clarification on the bottom is the stim channel. And so we're starting at cycle length 400 and then we're decreasing the R to R pacing interval to uh, 390. It looks like we're winky blocking. Uh, let me look at the stim more closely. Sorry, is that your answer that we're wanky boxing? <laughs> Let me um, look at it. it. That was my first inclination, but I want to look at it more closely okay. and see if that is true. Um, so the first three beats are definitely with the regular A, V, A, A, tree, A, H is maybe a mm -hmm. bit longer in that third one, but, um, and then I see an, a, the age is definitely longer than that fourth beat. Uh -huh. You're referring yeah. to here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the next conduction, continue, oh, so it's continually conducted at a longer age. So I would call this a, um, it's a jump with patients that have full pathways. Right, so this is an example of uh, probably dual AV node physiology, right, where you're rapid atrial pacing at cycle length 400 and the AH interval is about 105 milliseconds. But then at when you go down to 390, the AH interval lengthens uh, by almost 100 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. And as the pacing rate got faster and faster, this AH interval persisted at a longer AH interval, much longer than at shorter. So this is uh, soft evidence for the presence of dual AV node physiology in a patient. And I think with that, we're gonna stop for today. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.